Okay, we might make a start and let other people filter in as we go. Um, so next up we have Caleb. Caleb has worked professionally both as a software developer and as a chemical engineer and has been using Python for about 14 years. He's also one of PyCon's most avid retweeters and today he's here to talk to us about Scython. Give it up for Caleb. Thanks everyone for coming. It, it means a great deal to me to be able to do this and hopefully I can teach you something. Thank you very much. So, is anyone else tired about hearing about how Python is slow and about how the GIL present, prevents concurrency? I've been hearing that for over a decade now. And in, in the course of the work that I do, the speed is a frequent concern that one has about getting assimilations to run fast. And, it, and it's really easy to bypass. And the objective of my talk today is to explain to you that there are ways you can do that. And they're not that difficult. So I'm going to try and make a pitch. It's a sales pitch about how there's this thing called Python that you can use when you really need to, to go really, really fast. But it's easy, and, that, and that's the point of my talk. Not how fast you can go, but how easy it can be to get into. So let's begin. I'm not going to speak about this. My last slide covers me, so I, and I want to make sure I have time to cover everything, so I'm just going to move on. There's a lot of stuff in the world of Scython, and I'm not going to cover it all. I'm going to focus on only two things. The first is making your code faster, and the second is how to use all the CPUs in your machine or in a cluster. Shared memory concurrency, multi-threaded shared memory concurrency. And it's going to be easy. I'm going to show you really, really easy way of getting into this world. You don't have to know everything, but it's not that hard to get a little bit of code and make it faster. I'm going to hide a lot of the noise as well. So I have a tool for, for dealing with setup tools so you don't have to worry about that. So this is a question that comes up a lot online if you read forums and everything. Is Python fast? The first good answer that you usually reply with is, well, what do you mean by fast? It needs to just be fast enough for the task at hand. The much better question to, to ask in reply is, what do you mean by Python exactly? Because the thing is, Python itself is actually written in C, and it's optimized. One way to say that is to say that Python is as fast at doing what it, what it intends to do. But that's not what people are talking about. People are talking about when they write Python code, they have the that it is slow, right? So if you're new to this world, what, what is really happening is that Python is extremely dynamic. Python treats your code like a box of chocolates, and your, your variables can change type all the time. So your Python code is treated like a box of chocolates. And what the interpreter does is every time it sees a new variable, or even the same variable in a loop, it takes the chocolate out of the box, sees, oh, this, you're this kind of chocolate. OK, I'll do that with you. And then reaches in and takes another chocolate out of the box and says, oh, you're that kind of chocolate, now I'll do that with you. And even if you have a very, very big box, and every single chocolate is exactly the same type, and you want to do the same thing with it, Python doesn't care. It will check each time to make sure that your variable is the same thing. So one way to deal with that is to tell Python or some aspect of the execution engine that you are really dealing with the same thing all the time. And this, this is where the idea comes from, that you can give the type to things in your loops. And then it'll go much faster, because all this machinery about checking what you're actually working with and, and how to order that in the execution engine goes away, right? So that's what Scython does, uh, among other things. For, for our purposes, that's what it does. You can tell Python what your types of your variables are so that it doesn't have to check, and then it can process things efficiently. Part of what you need to get this to work is a compiler. So um, I've got on the slide, I'm not gonna go through them, but I've got on the slides here the ways to install compilers on a bunch of different operating systems. I've written a blog post, which is that URL shortened link at the bottom about how you can get it set up on Windows for 32-bit and 64-bit on Pi 27 and Pi 34. There are other guides as well online. A quick word about Windows. I, I hope I don't use too much time, but uh, you can't tell people to get a real operating system if what they work on is Windows. Uh, I feel incredibly strongly about that. It's extremely insensitive. I can't tell my eight-year-old students, you know, get a real operating system. They're, they're all running Windows. It's, I think that's an important point to make. You guys are the experts. You make sure that your code works on their machine. I, I think that's a, fair, that's a fair point to make. OK, so this is, this is a tool that does really nothing clever whatsoever. It just wraps the setup tools machinery to build your Python stuff. It's a command line tool. You basically say, easy Python, my Scython file, and it produces a, a, a binary object. There's, there's no magic behind it. If you look into the code, it's a single file, less than 100 lines. It really just creates a setup.py and does the compilation for you to make it simpler to use, right? 
So we're going to begin. We're going to begin extremely simply. There's no complexity here whatsoever. There's a main file and there's a simple.py module. We import the simple.py module and we run the function inside it. It takes two arguments and multiplies them together. Nothing, nothing strange whatsoever. Everyone in the room should be very comfortable with this. There I've got a terminal. I'm just printing out what the files are and the way I run the program is I say python main.py and it prints the answer six. Give you a moment to just digest that. Nothing complicated whatsoever. Now I'm going to use Cython and apply it to this problem. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to Cythonize that file there, simple.py. So that's, that, that's the change there. I've, I've just highlighted in yellow at the top what I've done. I've added an X to the file name. And then I call my magic setup tools handler, easy Cython simple.pyx. And after that process finishes, and you see the like, compiler stuff go on the screen, you list out in your terminal, you get a couple of files there. On, on the next slide, I'll go into that in detail. The red thing there is a shared object. That's your binary library, which you can import. Main.py main will import that in the same way that it imported a pi file, and it'll run the function inside it. So the first thing I want to, I want to drive home is, Cython is a superset of Python. You don't have to change your code. You can compile Cython, uh, you can compile normal Python through Cython completely transparently. You end up with a binary thing at the end, but all the Python code inside the Cython still works. And in fact, it gets executed by the same Python engine. The interpreter still runs the stuff inside the binary, the binary file. It's only when you begin to add types to the things inside the Cython file that you begin to get access to the underlying C library and, and the speed and so on. But that's the first thing I really want to drive home is that getting Starting to play with Cython is, is really, really easy to do. It doesn't involve a lot of work. Okay, so this is, this is what the tool made. Uh, we ran easy Cython on our simple.pyx, and the yellow stuff there is new stuff. The, the blue is also new. Ask me about that in question time. I'm not going to cover that, but it's cool. So the build folder comes from the compilation process. Simple.c is a C file that Cython made from our pyx file. So what Cython does is convert your pyx file into a C file, and simple.so is the binary shared object that you get after you compile the C file and link it against Python. Easy Cython, simple.pyx, and that gets spit out. It's not too complicated yet, right? It's pre pretty straightforward. So I try to come up with a case study, and, and the problem with Cython is that it's a tool that has been developed in the scientific community, and they usually introduce Cython at the same time as Fourier transforms or, you know, uh, scientific learning. It's difficult to tease apart the bits that are useful for non-scientific things from, from the really, really complicated science that neuroscientists present at conferences about brain imaging and so on. So I, I tried pretty hard to think of a good example, and the one thing that I came up with is tax, because death and taxes are common to everyone, right? I didn't want to go the death route because it's a bit morbid, so <laughs> went with the tax route. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to calculate everyone's tax. So this is a tax table. Uh, unless you're extremely young, you should know what this is because it influences you every year. Basically, in a progressive taxation system, the more you earn, the greater your tax rate is. So it's, a, it's, a pretty, it's an if-else statement. That's really what it is. Your taxable income gets checked on the left, and depending on which bin you're in, then your rate gets worked out on the right. Pretty straightforward. The Python code is a pretty much a one-to-one -one translation from the tax table, and this is one of the things why, why we love Python, why, why I use it, is because the code is extremely readable. I would argue, perhaps I'm biased, but I think that's actually more readable than the tax table. Because <laughs> you get a sense of how to apply it, right? So I'm going to switch between the Cython, the pure Cython version of that, and this. So I'm going to just go forward and back. So. That's the Cython code. I've added CP in front of the diff. The return type is a double precision number. And the argument amount is a double precision number. And that's it, right? So I change the extension of that thing to PYX, and then I run it through Easy Cython, and I get a binary thing out. Again, you don't have to use Easy Cython. That's not required whatsoever. Uh, the guide for Cython says you have to write a setup.py file and put, say which things must get compiled with what arguments, and then you'll get the same outcome. Easy Cython just does that. It, it, it's really just scaffolding. There's no magic. So go back quickly. Python, Cython. Python, 
siphon. So I, I'm, I'm trying to impress, in, impress on you that the logic really hasn't changed in the function. It's really just types that I'm applying there and that mysterious CP at the front, right? So I'm, I'm hoping everywhere. I have a blindness for, for, for things that I'm used to, so I'm just trying to make sure, I'm absolutely sure that you really follow what's going on. Okay, so uh, there are 11 and a half million registered taxpayers in Australia. I just went with 10 million just to, just to make it simpler. I randomized a bunch of incomes. So $5,000 a year to $500,000 a year. Big long list and I want to calculate everyone's tax and then add it up. Pretty, pretty straightforward calculation. If you are doing a games engine like, like a, an economic simulation of some kind, you might want to do this calculation many times. If you are trying to optimize a tax table for some objective, you would have to do this a lot of times. So there is an issue of speed. You might want to be able to do this pretty quickly, right? So I've got my generator in there to call tax Python for I in incomes, where incomes is my 10 million list of array. And then I sum them all together. So how long does that take to run? All of these things were run on my computer, and I'm going to show you times, and I don't want you to take away from this what the absolute times are, but what I'm really trying to impress on is the kind of reduction you can get and how little work you need to put in to, 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 to access that. So that takes 12 seconds, right? The Python function, I've got my list, sum it up, 12 seconds. It's okay, 12 seconds is not bad. If I have to do that a thousand times, it begins to become difficult to, to really play with the system and reason about it. So the function that I made a Cython version of earlier, the one that I just showed you on the previous slide, that's eight times faster, oh. right? <laughs> hold on, hold on, wait, it's going to get better. <laughs> okay, so first question is, that loop there is actually still Python code. I'm still calling my function in a loop that runs in Python. So what happens if you put the loop in Cython as well? It's a good question. So we're going to also loop in Cython. I'll show you the code a little bit later because I don't want that noise to interfere with the impact I'm about to make, which is that takes 50 milliseconds. Okay. So that's, that's a speed of 220 times, which is more than I'm used to. You, I'm, with numerical code, I'm used to getting about 170 times speed up. But significant. It's, it's, it's game changing, actually, to be able to do this. But, but, but again, what I want to impress upon you is how little work we had to do for this result. Although I'm still going to show you what, what the loop looks like. It's not too bad, but pretty, pretty tractable, right? You can, you can get a hotspot in your code, and you can make a couple of very small changes and, and, and kind of get a reasonable uh, speed up. I don't think you could make it go much faster if you wrote C natively, and I don't know C that well, so I, I definitely couldn't do it. So this is a huge benefit to me in the work that I've had to do. So. Uh, I just want to show you quick comparisons with some other methods that you may have heard about for speeding up code. Ask me about them in question time. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. But just to give you an idea of, of other tools that exist and what you might be able to do with them. So the first thing is NumPy, right? With this kind of problem, NumPy actually doesn't help you. The reason is because we're doing slightly different operations on each element in our array. If you're doing the same thing to every element in an array, NumPy is awesome. It, it's fantastic. You can crunch enormous uh, quantities of numbers, and, and it's great. But with this kind of scenario where you're doing a, a different, slightly different calculation on each element in a long list of numbers, NumPy actually doesn't help you at all because the calculation is still getting done at the Python level. So I just wanted to show you there uh, the, the one we did where we used Python code and we called our Cython function. You can wrap that in a NumPy vectorized statement, and you really don't get very much speed up at all. It, it's pretty much doing a glorified loop around your stuff, and it's letting your function play with NumPy's broadcasting rules. So, so with this kind of situation, NumPy doesn't help you. That, that's the conclusion there. With PyPy, I'm not a PyPy expert. I've used it a little bit. I homebrew installed whatever PyPy was in the list, and I ran that on my Python version, and I got 50 times. I think that's pretty reasonable for really very not, not very much effort on my part. I, I think that's worth looking at. I love the PyPy project. I'm not against them whatsoever, and I wish them every success. I regularly try out new PyPy uh, releases on some of my code. And the last one is number. So number is also in the 50 millisecond ballpark. In fact, you get really the same answer that you get in Cython. And what you have to do with number is you just have to add that JIT decorator to your functions, to the loop and, and to your tax calculation function. And then you get the same answer. But not, no more about that. Ask me about it in question time why this talk is not about number and why it's about Cython. So this is the loop that I said. 
Originally, we just had a sum generator in Python where we just had an if statement, uh, a, a loop, and we just walked over our tax calculation and summed it up. This is what the loop looks like in Cython. And once you start using Cython a lot, pretty much most of your Cython code is, is going to look like this. This is almost idiomatic, right? So you've got your return type there. It's going to return a double, double precision number. You have an array of doubles which are going to come in, and, and this, is, this is pretty idiomatic. It's going to look like that. If it's integers, you'll say int, colon. If it's something else, it'll be something else like that. There you've got all the types of the variables that you're going to use in your function. Look, that's, that's the entire function. There's, there's nothing else. That is the loop. That does the, the call out to the other thing that we siphoned, and, and it returns the total there. Most of your Cython will look like this if you do it. So we don't. So that's how to speed up code in Cython. I think it's, it's a remarkably efficient use of your time to learn a little bit of Cython and get massive, enormous speed ups in your code. And you get to bleed it in. You get all the benefits of Python in your code that is Python and doesn't need to run fast. And then the bits that need to run fast can run pretty much native C speed. I, th I think that's enormously beneficial. And, and we don't sell this. The scientific community, community does not sell this strongly enough, I think, to the non-scientific audience. Multicore, so concurrency, JavaScript. So we're not talking about concurrency that is you know, single core, asynchronous, I.O. bound type processes. What we're talking about here is multi-core, multi-threaded, shared memory concurrency. Shared memory, so you have got multiple threads that are accessing the same memory. So if you truly love the gill, set it free. <laughs> so this is the same loop that I just showed you, right? This is the work that's going to come in. There are our array of incomes at the top. And it's, it's exactly the same loop. The only change is what it marks in yellow there. When you have a context handler with no gill, that releases the lock. That's it. That's the change. So that code will now run, and it won't consume the lock from Python, and it will, it will run happily on its own in, on, on a separate call. One tiny catch. Um, I've marked the name of the function there in red. There's just one little thing that you have to do. One of the provisions of this context handler is that every function that you call inside of it just has to be marked with a no gill directive. And what that does is the compi it allows a compiler to check that you're not calling Python anywhere in, in, in your code. That, that's really all it does. You can't, you can't release the lock if any part of your code inside the context handler is calling into Python. So it all has to be typed, and it becomes native C on the back end. So what that looks like is, there, you just add that there. So our loop has context handler that says with no gill. Just show you back there. That's what it looks like there. And it calls into our function, and our function just has to get that mark on the top. So that's it. So now we have to set up our threads. And this is, this is my favorite part of the talk. Uh, I think this is just the most awesome thing. Python threads are awesome, right? That guy just said my story was cool, and he called me bro. We've been, we've, we've, it's become like a, 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 um, a cargo cult inside Python that threads are bad. Don't use threads. They're not really threads. They're not running concurrently. But the thing is, we just released the luck. We just released that. So can threads work for us again, right? So I'm going to leave this slide up. I've, I've got some time left. I'm going to leave this slide up for, for quite a while. I want you to take it in. I think this is, the, this is the most awesome thing I've seen in a long time. And in preparing these slides, I had originally had Python 2 threading. This thread pool executor is a Python 3 thing that I, that I played with. And I, I think it's just marvelous. So that comes from Python 3. You can't get that in Python 2. It's a thing that you run in a context handler. I've got four CPUs in my laptop, so I make the workers before there. You get this thing, which is a job handler, which I called exe there. NumPy provides an array split function, which splits your work into the number of pieces you say, but it returns views. So that's, that's not copied stuff. It returns four views on your chunk of memory, right? So you get sections. So sections is a list of, of four things that are views into a single array of memory. And then we've got our iterator, where we submit jobs. And the way the jobs get submitted is you give your function. So that's my loop. That's my loop that does the summation, is tote tax. And then s is the section. So the jobs that you submit is your, your work function and the arguments for the work function. 
and I get jobs. I wait for them to return results and I sum them back on the way out. You cannot get bugs into this. If you've ever written native threads in C, it's, it's the kind of thing you do that your takeaway is, I should never do this again. This is, this is terrible, <laughs> right? In, in Windows, nonetheless, I've done it before in Windows. It's, it's awful. Multi-threaded programming is supposed to be awful, right? You can't get this wrong. It's, it's very nearly brain dead once you, once you get this pattern going. And I thought this was really amazing. That's, that, this is my big takeaway from, from preparing this talk. So, we've released the lock, and we've got our threads set up, and we're submitting jobs to them. So, do we get, what kind of benefit do we do? Do we get any benefit at all? So, remarkably, we, we, we get massive benefit, right? Um, I've got the number of threads there on the bottom, and I'm, I'm running on my MacBook. It's got four cores. At one thread, we get our 50 milliseconds. That's up there on the top left. And two threads comes down, three and four. And around four, it kind of levels up. The, the improvement is fake that you see as it goes up to eight. Th th there's noise, and that variation is within the noise. So pretty much at four, it kind of flattens out because that's how many CPUs I've got. That's, that efficiency is 92%. So I'm getting 92% of what you would expect in an ideal world where you know, the amount of work that you can do is exactly equal to the number of cores you add to the system. I've got no doubt that if I ran this on AWS EC2 cluster with 64 CPUs, that it wouldn't be as high as that. But it would be significant, and depending on the size of my work, I'm pretty sure I'd get, I'd get a really big improvement. And I have a pretty good confidence that it's going to run and work. I, I really don't expect any bugs because the code is so short. So that's 14 milliseconds that I'm, that I'm now down at on my MacBook. And it, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just to, just to be absolutely clear, I'm, I'm not trying to say that you know, using more cores is better than single core. That, that, that's obvious, but the takeaway that I want you to get is it's not that difficult to get that. If you've got code that is slow and you want to make a bit of it fast, like there's some part of your code that's just really bogging down your, your, your application, it's not that hard to get there, and the tools are available to, to make it relatively easy to do. And you can do this. And in certain classes of problems, it's easy to do multi-threaded programming. And this is one of them. So it's so great, right? We should, we should siphon everything, like all of our programs. We should run through this thing and you know, get, get this optimal speed and everything. And the thing is, no. No, that doesn't work. And I've tried that because it's intoxicating. It's like, a, you know, it's like fine wine or crack or something. It's <laughs> when you come down, it, it, it really hurts. So good advice. Use, use Scython very sparingly. Measure, make sure which bits of your code are taking a long time to run. Just do those bits. The smaller, the smaller that you can confine the scope of your Scython work to get the maximum benefit is really, really what you want to be doing. The world gets lonely and a scary place as you move away from Python. Yeah, I, I, I've suffered. I've, I've suffered a great deal from trying to add Scython to, to too much code. The 90-10 rule very much applies. Uh, find the 10% of your code that is taking 90% of the time and just focus there. I wish I could tell you a lot more. There are other things that Scython does that, that, that are magical and amazing. It's not just this. There are other things. Extension types in Scython are ridiculously easy to do. They're basically Python classes with little bits of extra magic, and um, they, they run extremely fast. And it's easy to make things that work and, and don't fail because of bad memory access. So, so it's pretty easy to do, right? One of the criticisms with Scython is, well, now you need to know both C and Python to, to get it to do anything. And, and that's painting not true. I don't know C that well. I, I learn a little bit as I go. But I am not a C programmer. And I, I have used Scython heavily. So there are other projects that also try and tackle the, the, the speed question. But not only the, the, the speed question, and they also have slightly different trade-offs in, in how they want to approach things. PyPy wants you know, to tackle the problem of just native Python without any decoration of types. Number has a very strong focus on trying to get Fortran speed for number crunching. Shared skin has their own thing. Nuitka is another one. And NumExper is vectorizing calculations easily. But this is a happy ecosystem. Sometimes there seems to be a little bit of confrontation between the groups. But mostly they get along well. And everyone is trying to 
uh, follow the same dream, which is to make Python applicable to as many domains as, as possible. I personally have high hopes for PyPy number. I'm very supportive of, the, of, of those projects, and I do check them out regularly when they bring out new releases. And that's my slide. I'm starting a company, which is kind of insane. I don't have the funding or the know-how to do that, but I'm trying anyway. And I've got a minute to spare, so we've got more question time. Thanks, Caleb. That's awesome. I just wanted to give a plug for Python XY, which is a Windows bundle which includes Dev C++, which is MinGW, and is a simple install which gives Windows people um, Cython ready to go. Anaconda does the same, so they're pretty good as well. Yeah. They include that. And um, Win, WinPython is the other one, which is similar to Python XY. The same guy that does both. That's pretty good as well. Thanks. Um, your example was of something which is what I'd call data parallelizable, which is that you can essentially independently process <laughs> subparts of the data and then do a combine at the end. Um, do you have, are there best patterns for doing non-data parallelizable tasks? That's a great question and I'm probably the wrong person to do that. I, I, I don't have a computer science background, so whatever I learn is what I need to do to accomplish things, so I, I, I learned the hard way, which is stumbling blindly through the forest trying to make my way through. Caleb, uh, great talk, thank you. You wanted us to ask you about simple HTML, so consider yourself asked. <laughs> Good, okay, so that's that file. So the HTML that comes up looks like that. So what it is, is pretty clever. It's, it's a HTML file with some coloring and syntax highlighting, and, it, and the yellow indicates the proximity to the Python runtime. So if a line is white, it means there's no proximity, which means that gets compiled completely natively and is independent of Python. If there's some yellow, there, there, there is some proximity to the Python runtime. And I, I don't know if you can see, there's this line here at the bottom is vaguely uh, yellow. It's got a, got a lighter shade of yellow. If you click on any of these lines, it'll show you the underlying C code that represents that line, right? And what you see when you open that line up is that Cython has put a check in to see whether you're referencing in that I there something that doesn't exist. So it's an out of bounds check that's happening. You can add an additional decorator um, above or below the wraparound, Cython.wraparound, that says bounds check false. And if you set that to be false, then that pale yellow line goes away and it no longer does the bounds check. And you get another 5% speed. Cython is safe by default. So any way that your code could fail for, for the usual suspects like out of bounds accesses and, and, and similar things, integers that wrap around, Cython's default is, is to be safe. So Python exceptions get thrown when those things occur, which is enormously beneficial. You don't, you don't get you know, uh, really bad crashes and access violations and so on. So that's, that's the view file, that's what you get. So you can click on any of the lines and you can see what the underlying C code is. It's not really pretty code, and the variables all become really strange variables with lots of underscores around them. So it kind of looks ugly, but if you work with this a lot, you'll have to deal with that. And what I usually do is I just try and figure out, if my code is too complex, and I figure out what, what bit I can change to make it a bit simpler, and try to reason about what it's doing without digging too much into the C. Yeah, so that's that one. So um, the, uh, here we are adding some types to the uh, code, right? Like what about the overflows, the type checking? This seems to be a simple example of double, actually. What if a, ca a ca car star or a cons car star is added? Is it not like uh, going to be too tedious to use Cython? Second thing is like instead of using a, a, a dot .pyx or this way of uh, uh, making it a C type Python, why can't we write a native uh, uh, Cython code in C and use it as an extension in Python? Is it not more faster? Great question. So this, the second one first. It is not faster. Not only is it not faster, it's more difficult to write if you do it in C. And unless you're a good C programmer, you're probably gonna get it wrong. Th that has been my experience. Making code easy to write is, the, is your best protection against, against bugs. 
Um, I, I think a good C programmer probably can do tricks that, that can get faster than what can be represented. But the guys who make Scython, they're incredibly smart people. Like, wait, I'm, I'm not in their ballpark. I'm, I'm here just here pitching it to you. But they're, they're really good, and they know all the tricks, and, and many of them are Fortran programmers, actually. Long time Fortran programmers, significant number crunching stuff. Um, I think if you really know what you're doing in C, you maybe you, you can, probably you can. But I am not that guy, and I, I, don't, think, I don't think most people are. Uh, the first part of your question was, what if the types are more complex, right? As you add Scython stuff to your code, you, you move in a continuum from Python to C. So whatever you can do in C, you actually can do in Scython. You can do casts. There's, there's a syntax for doing casts in front of variables. So you, ca you can do that, and you can handle complex cases, but the code becomes a bit more complex to work with. But you can do it. Yeah, so you'll get a Python exception if you overflow, unless you turn that off. And then, you, and then you won't get an overflow exception. You'll actually get a crash, some kind of access violation or something. Um, sorry, OK. Can we get uh, a, you, you raised at the end uh, PyPy, which is one project. Do you actually have the numbers for how fast PyPy does this? Because this would seem to be the sweet spot for what PyPy can do. So I had that, do you mean? Oh, wait, I went too far, right? Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, so... Oh, sorry, did I, miss the, I must have missed the slide. I'm sorry, I do apologize. Um, yeah, so, so I, I don't want to say that's the best PyPy can do against the performance of the other stuff. It's a, it's a naive... I homebrew installed PyPy and I ran my Python code through it and that's what I got. So, so 50 okay, times yep. without doing anything else is, is actually pretty, pretty good, good, I think. Okay. Um, the other one is just other, pro other projects in the community that this sort of relates to. Uh, the type annotations that's coming in the upcoming 3.5, is there any plan for Scython to use those type annotations in, instead of in addition to its own declarations or...? I speak under correction, but I don't think so. Okay. And it's kind of disappointing that more of an effort wasn't made to kind of marry the, the type syntaxes together. So what we're probably going to have is, you know, in Scython 3 stuff, once type annotations become popular, we're going to have it twice. You're going to have Scython types and then the other types, which will, which will be disappointing. I think we should not do that. <laughs> 